I wish to welcome you to yet another lecture of neuroanatomy, where we are now going to focus on ascending pathways. This lecture comes as a follow up on the anatomy of the brainstem and anatomy of the spinal cord. Um, when we discussed those two concepts, we noted that there's some fiber tracts that go through the brainstem and through the spinal cord and they carry information. So we are going to look at these particular fibers. So maybe just to orient you where we are on our lecture series, we've done quite a big chunk of neuroanatomy lectures indeed. And uh, even part one of this, we covered the structure organization, the spinal cord. So in this part two, we are looking at the tracts themselves. Maybe just as a matter of introduction, we need to understand some terminologies. The term tractology refers to the study of tracts. But what is a tract? A tract, which can also be called fasciculus, refer to a bundle of neuronal fibers of the same function traveling together within the central nervous system. So you are unlikely to talk about a tract outside the central nervous system. It's a group of neuronal fibers of similar function traveling together within the central nervous system, which means can either be within the spinal cord, within the brainstem, within the cerebrum, within the cerebellum. But either way, it's a, a group of neuronal fibers of the same function traveling together. You can call it a tract or you can call it fasciculus. Tract can be classified based on a number of parameters. You can classify them based on where they come from and where they're going. You can classify them based on their morphology. But we can also classify them based on the direction of impulses which allude to whether they are either sensory or motor. Now, there's a group that we call ascending tracts. Ascending tracts are called so because they carry sensory information towards the brain. So they are part of the afferent system. Similarly, there's a group that we call the descending tracts. Descending tracts are motor tracts because they carry impulses away from the brain towards the effectors. And so they'll constitute the efferent system. So I want you to get that right because now from here, we are going to narrow on the ascending tract only. Then we'll have another lecture on the descending tracts. So get it that ascending tracts are sensory tracts, carrying impulses towards the cerebral cortex. Descending tracts are motor tracts, carrying impulses from the cerebral cortex or wherever towards the effectors, which are either muscles or glands. Maybe to help you understand the concept of sensory and motor, let's revisit the functional model of the central nervous system or generally the nervous system. We know that the nervous system integrates and coordinates body functions, but it does this in a particular functional model. We describe this functional model in our introductory lectures, but let's repeat it here. 
we have what we call sensory receptors, which generally detect environmental stimuli. Once they've detected the environmental stimuli, they convey these impulses to the nervous system. Now, the examples of sensory receptors we'll be talking about, but remember the environmental stimuli can be of different types. There could be sensations of heat, cold, pressure, vibration, light, sound, whatever kind of environmental impulse. The sensory receptors detect these impulses and convert these impulses to neuronal impulses, which are then relayed toward the cerebral cortex. Now, the journey from the sensory receptors to the cerebral cortex is not a journey of a single neuron. And I remember the example I gave you some time back is based on, let's say you're walking and you step on a sharp thing, which is painful, of course. The information from your big toe to the cerebral cortex will go via neurons, but it's not just one neuron. It's a relay of three neurons generally. The first neuron will take impulses from the receptor to the spinal cord or brain stem. We call that the first order sensory neuron. The first order sensory neuron will generally be a pseudonipolar neuron for most general sensations. And so the cell bodies of these neurons are usually outside the central nervous system. It will send us the what we call second order sensory neuron. Second order sensory neuron generally decassates and terminate the thalamus. And then that will synapse with the third order sensory neuron, which take information from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex. So this is the afferent division of the nervous system, or what we call the ascending pathways, these ones. At the cerebral cortex, what happens? The cerebral cortex interprets the sensation that has come in, other than doing that, it will also keep memory of the sensation and provide a response. Among other things that this cerebral cortex may do, these three, we can highlight them here. When a response is provided with this cerebral cortex, that response must go back to effectors. Effectors are the structures that execute responses and they can either be mass salts or glands. Again, the journey from the cerebral cortex to the effectors is not a journey of a single neuron, but generally a journey of two neurons. Now we won't call them first order and second order, we call them upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. The upper motor neuron usually decassates and terminate either in the brainstem or spinal cord. The lower motor neuron is the one that come out from either the brainstem for cranial nerves or spinal cord for spinal nerves and will reach the effect. The upper motor neuron doesn't have to decassate. We are going to see that there are some that actually don't decassate. So this division, is what we call the motor division or the efferent division or the descending pathways. So I now think you understand why this division would be called ascending pathway and this division would be called the descending pathway. The sensory division impulse are going upwards motor division, the impulse are going downwards. So with that understanding, we can now narrow down to our ascending pathway. We can redefine what is a sensory tract or what is an ascending tract. 
So we can define it as bundle of neuronal fiber processes that convey sensory signals from sensory receptors to the brain. Those are ascending pathways, basically. Most ascending pathways consist of four elements. And we'll talk about these four elements in very good detail, one by one. The first element is the sensory receptor. The second one is the first order sensory neuron, or what we call the primary sensory neuron. The third element is the second order sensory neuron, or what we call the secondary sensory neuron. And the third element is the third order, sorry, the fourth element is the third order sensory neuron, or what we call the tertiary sensory neuron. The model I've chosen to approach this lecture is to give you good detail of the template of ascending pathways. Then we can narrow down to specific ascending pathways and highlight what is unique about them. Because there are a lot of overlap between different ascending pathways. And so if I give you the template, it will be much easier now to understand specific pathways because you now have a template. So we'll take time to go through the template. We'll take more time on the template and less time on specific pathways actually. So I want to be very keen as you follow on the template because if you miss the template, you're unlikely to grasp the specific pathways, you will just be cramming them. But if you understand how the template is organized, how these four elements operate, then it will be easier for you to understand specific pathways. Okay, so I want us to discuss those four in that order. We will start with the first element, which is the sensory receptors. Sensory receptors are generally modified neurons or epithelial cells that detect environmental stimuli. And uh, of fundamental importance is that sensory receptors convert physical energies which are within the stimuli to bioelectric impulses, which can be relayed through the nervous system. Remember, the nervous system understands only one language, and that is action potentials. So there are several sensor receptors, but a sensor receptor must convert physical energy in the environmental stimuli into action potential. So much so that if something cannot convert environmental stimulus into nerve impulses, it cannot qualify to be called a sensor receptor. And if something can convert the same, it definitely qualifies to be called a sensor receptor. It's the rule of the thumb. All right, generally, there are several sensory modalities, pain, temperature, touch, pressure, vision, hearing, vibration, proprioception, name them. There are very many. But usually we'll see that a sensory modality will have a particular unique sensory receptor that detects it. You wouldn't expect the receptors for light to be the same as the receptors for hearing, for example. The receptor for hearing is very different from the receptor for light. So with that understanding, maybe we can cite a few examples of sensory receptors. Remember, sensations can be divided into two. We have special sensations and general sensations. 
special sensations are five. Vision, hearing, smell, taste, and vestibular function. The rest are general sensations. So let's look at receptors for general sensations. Then we also look at receptors for special sensations. We'll just name them. This is not the lecture focusing on receptors. There's another lecture that focus just on receptors. So here we'll just name them, really not discussing them. Maybe just the other thing we'll do is to state the sensory modality that the receptor detects. So the first one we see here, we see some free nerve endings that are terminating on the epidermis of the skin. That's how it will look like if you are to redraw it. We actually just call them free nerve endings. These are receptors for pain, for heat, for cold, and for light, light touch. Free nerve endings. They're found on the epidermis of the skin. There's another one here. We see it in the papillary dermis. If you are to redraw it, it will look like this. We call it Meisner's corpuscle. Meisner's corpuscles are receptors for light touch as well. Yet another one, they look like cut onion bulb. They are found deep in the skin, maybe in the hypodermis. Concentric lamellae, if you are to draw that, look like that, encapsulated with several lamellae of connective tissue and uh, a nerve at the center of it. We call this one Pacinian corpuscle. It's a receptor for vibration. Okay, that still is Pacinian corpuscle, receptor for vibration found deep. It's a deep receptor. This one, we call it uh, Ruffini terminal or Ruffini corpuscle. Perhaps if you draw it, it look like that. This one detects stretch. It may also detect heat sensation. This one called the Krauss end bulb, also found on skin and other places. The Krauss end bulb, we're not so sure, but uh, it's believed that it may detect cold sensation. So these are that show you where Mesnas is expected, free nerve endings, Ruffini, Pacinian corpuscle, maybe one remaining when you talk about. That's the Merkel's disc. Merkel's disc is a, a collaboration between a nerve terminal and the Merkel cells of the epidermis. So that's how they collaborate. Maybe a high magnification will show us that or this one. Merkel's discs are mechanoreceptors, generally being receptors for crude touch. We go deeper to muscles and we get also other receptors like this one encapsulated with some muscle fibers inside called interfusal fibers. In cross section, that's what you look like and the long section look like that with some large fibers, which you call nuclear bug and thin ones we call nuclear chain fibers. We call this one the neuromuscular spindle neuromuscular spindle or simply muscle spindle is a proprioceptor, receptors for proprioception. They are found within muscles. They detect the stretch of muscle. Maybe just to help you understand, usually there are two types of proprioceptors within muscles. We have what you call the muscle spindle or neuromuscular spindle, which detects stretch and perhaps the speed of stretch located within or rather between skeletal muscle fibers. 
Then there's another one called the Golgi tendon organ. Golgi tendon organ is located at the junction between muscle and tendon. And this one detect tension within muscle. So these two help us to know the position of the joints. And that help us to know the position of the body. So there are proprioceptors, receptors for proprioception, receptors for position sense. Good, those are general sensory receptors. Now let me also take you through special sensory receptors, which means receptors for special sensations. As I'd informed you earlier, we have five special sensations, vision, hearing, smell, taste, and vestibular function. What we notice about the special sensations is that they're limited in the head region. And they are specifically or exclusively conveyed by cranial nerves. Now, there's one we see here, an epithelium, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium without goblet cells, and we see some nerve bundles dip. This is the olfactory epithelium. And olfactory epithelium is the receptor for smell located on the roof of the nasal cavity. So usually it has some bipolar neurons there that will be able to detect the odiferous substances. We also see another epithelium here, stratified squamous non keratinous epithelium which is uh, interrupted with some regions that appear light like that with some cells. If you are to magnify that, we see this is how it look like. This is what we call the taste buds. They're found on the surface of the tongue. And so these are receptors for taste. Here we see some cavities within bone and there's something there at a high magnification. We see it here with some delicate membranes. This is the spiral organ of Corti, which is the receptor for hearing. And lastly, we see something here with multiple layers, indeed well-defined, usually there are a number of cell types in this receptor which are organized in layers, and those cell types are these ones. Basically, this is how the retina looks like. That's the retina of the eye. There are several cells in the retina, rods and cones are the photoreceptor cells. So the retina is receptor for light. So those are just examples of receptors. To tell you that if you're discussing an ascending pathway, we first want you to begin by telling us the receptor for that particular sensation that you're talking about. All right. After you've told us about the receptor of the sensation you're talking about, then you tell us about the second element. The second element is the first order sensory neuron. So remember, if you are to be asked to describe a pathway, of course, you don't list all the receptors that I've given you in this lecture. You just mention the ones that apply to the sensation you're talking about. So if it's pain, just tell us the receptors for pain. If you're discussing visual pathway, just talk about the retina. You don't have to talk about the organ of coating. You just mention, and usually, for sensor receptors, you just mentioned them. There's nothing much. Now, the big deal comes on the first order and the second order neuron discussion. That's where the bulk of the story is when you're discussing a pathway. Let's go through them. What are first order sensory neurons? These are neurons that arise directly from the sensor receptor. They may be part of the receptor or arising from the receptor but they're the ones that are directly from the receptor. 
Most of them are pseudonipolar neurons, and this will largely apply to general sensations. A few are bipolar neurons. The bipolar neurons will be largely the ones in the retina and the ones from the olfactory receptor. So look at this one. This is the, the pseudonipolar neuron. That's how pseudonipolar neuron will look like. The dendritic process will be the one going to the receptor itself or part of the receptor. And then the axonal process will be the one entering the central nervous system, the cell body somewhere. So this cell body will be located outside the CNS. And so if there are several of them, they'll form a ganglion, what we call sensory ganglion. If it is for spinal nerves, then it will be the dorsal root ganglion. For cranial nerves, it will be depending on which nerve we're talking about. Generally, I want you to understand that the cell bodies of the pseudopolar neurons are outside the CNS, and so they form sensory ganglia. So with a few exceptions, the peripheral process of the first order sensory neurons are actually the ones that constitute the sensory nerves that we talk about. So when you say this nerve is a sensory nerve, you know, whether they're cranial nerves or they are spinal nerves, when you talk of a sensory nerve, usually it is this peripheral process here that will constitute what you call that nerve. Think about any sensory nerve you know in the body. It just refers to a bundle of peripheral processes of pseudonipolar neurons. Based on the structure, the cell bodies of the first order sensory neurons, as I've told you, will be generally in the peripheral nervous system to form the sensory ganglia. For example, the dorsal root ganglion of spinal nerves. So, if you are telling us a story of first order sensory neuron, you are discussing an ascending pathway and you want to tell us a story regarding the second element, which is the first order sensory neuron. What is it we expect you to highlight? We expect you to highlight the nerve that carry the peripheral processes for that particular sensation we are discussing. This you'll know if you know the anatomical site being discussed. For example, you're discussing pain from the palmar aspect of the middle finger, we know that impulses will go via eventually the median nerve, for example. You are discussing pain from the forehead. We know that the impulses will go via the ophthalmic nerve, which will go to the trigeminal nerve. So we want you to name the peripheral process that name the nerve that carry the peripheral processes for the first order sensory neuron. Then we also want you to name the sensory ganglion that contain the cell bodies. Usually for spinal nerves, this will be the dorsal root ganglion, all of them. But for cranial nerves, it will depend on the cranial nerve in question. For example, if it's trigeminal nerve, then we call it the trigeminal sensory ganglion. If it's facial nerve, we call it the geniculate ganglion. And perhaps you need to be familiar therefore with the ganglia of some cranial nerves for that matter. After that, we then want to know the site or level of the CNS at which the central process of the first order sensory neuron is entering. Maybe I need to rephrase that. Remember, we agreed that first order sensory neuron has a peripheral process and a central process and a cell body in between. 
the peripheral process has formed part of a sensory nerve, either cranial or spinal. The central process enters the central nervous system. At what point does the central process enter the CNS? That's what we want to know. And you might be wondering, how do you then know that? It's a straightforward thing. For, for cranial nerves, just figure out where does this cranial nerve usually attach on the brainstem? Does it attach on the midbrain? Is it attaching on pons or medulla oblongata? Then that's what you give us because that's what it, where it enters. Is it medulla? Is it pons? Is it midbrain? Is it pontomedullary junction? Whatever. How about if it's a spinal nerve? If it's a spinal nerve, it might be a bit tricky, but if you know it, it's the simpler one, actually. Remember, spinal nerves will be going generally to skin. And so these skin regions have what you call dermatome. A dermatome is a skin segment supplied by a single segment of a spinal nerve, a single segment of the spinal cord. So if, for example, the example I gave you of the palmar surface of the middle finger, we know that this one is dermatome C7, which means what? The nerve fibers that come from here enter the spinal cord at the level C7. So we now know it's easy. From the dermatome, you'll be able to know at what point the central process enters. After the central process has entered the CNS, usually there are many of them, so they'll be forming some tracts. We want to know which tract the first order sensory neuron central processes form once they enter the central nervous system. As a general rule, usually most spinal nerves will form a tract which we call the dorsolateral tract. Most, if not all, will form that tract as they enter. The dorsolateral tract is just between the dorsal column and the lateral column of the spinal cord from the periphery up to the dorsal horn. So that is what we call the dorsolateral tract of Lisawa. Most of them will form that tract because they enter through there anyway. However, others will form other tracts from there. There are other pathways that will form other tracts from there, and we'll see now which ones form other tracts. And some of them will stop around there. They'll synapse in the gray matter at that dorsal hole. That's for spinal nerves. For cranial nerves, the story might be different for each, but remember the concept is that once the central process has entered the CNS, it may form some tract give us the name of that tract. Then the central process will have to terminate somewhere. The central process terminates where it synapses with the second order sensory neuron. So where does it terminate? Where it terminates will be most likely around where the cell bodies of the second order sensory neurons are found. So it will be a nucleus within the central nervous system. We want to know the name of the nucleus. Also, we want to know where that nucleus is located. Is the nucleus in the spinal cord? Is it in the medulla? Is it in the pons? or is it in the midbrain? Perhaps you just have those four options only. And so the CNS level is not a difficult thing. But this nuclei also have names. And when you discuss specific pathways, now we'll put meat into that particular concept and say, so what do we call the nucleus for this particular pathway? 
but remember the concept we want to know the level of the nucleus where it's found is it spinal cord medulla oblongata pons of midbrain and was the name given to that nucleus good that's the story of the first order sensory neuron maybe let me just use some images to illustrate for you what you've said the images we are seeing here illustrate for us okay let's start with the first one there on one side the dermatomes of the body and uh, on the other side the nerve territories let's pick a territory for the median nerve for example so this is the palmar aspect of the hand the radial side we see median nerve there but then now we trace that on this other end and we note that uh, for the middle finger that's actually c7 the dermatome c7 so we know that uh, from here it will be median nerve dermatome c7 this will still be median nerve but now dermatome c6 so the concept here is that you need to know the dermatomes there's no shortcut about it and so that you are able to pick the spinal cord segment that will receive the center process this other one also illustrates for you what dermatomes are basically for the body and if you understand it this way then dermatomes are actually not difficult things they're just territories of spinal segments that supply the skin each segment will go to each each neuron will go to a particular segment in the spinal cord and we are aware that there are multiple segments of the spinal cord the cervical segments are eight c1 to c8 thoracic 12 t1 to 12 lumbar 5 l1 12 5 sacral 5 s1 to s5 now we say that uh, the first order sensory neuron is most likely a pseudonipolar neuron and it will arise from a receptor the peripheral process is carried within a particular nerve so we want i told you that you need to know the name of that nerve if you've been given a region of the skin you should be able to know the nerve or if you have been given the name of the organ you can know the nerve for example if it is vision then we know that the nerve will be optic nerve or rather maybe optic nerve is not a good one to use but let me use let's say it's a hearing then we know that the nerve will be the cochlear nerve i've withdrawn the one for optic because that one's a bit unique optic nerve is actually a second order neuron not a first order neuron but uh, cochlear nerve is a good one to use so from the receptor for hearing we have the first order neuron which we call cochlear now how about here let's say this is pain so the receptor for pain is here on the skin and so this is a first order sensory neuron it is pseudonipolar in this case which means that that's a peripheral process and that the cell body we agree that this one will constitute a ganglion you give us the name of the ganglion for spinal nerves they're all dorsal root ganglia for cranial nerves, they'll be depending on which cranial nerve. Then that's the central process. The central process enters the CNS. Usually for spinal nerves, it will enter through the dorsal root. And at this point here, that's where you have the dorsal lateral tract of Lissauer, when multiple central process enter the form tracts. Remember, we want to know the level of the CNS that this one enters, and that will get from the dermatome. Then you give us the name of the tract, then you give us the point of termination. Now look at that. This one is terminating to the second order neuron at that point. So you just give us the name of the nucleus there. In this case, so that is the dorsal horn. 
you know, that's a nucleus, the dorsal horn. And uh, we also see that is actually the level of the spinal cord, so that the CNS level, spinal cord. As simple as that. Let's try another one. For this one, the receptor is here. So this is perhaps that is a Pacinian corpuscle. So carrying sensation, there'll be a nerve that carry the peripheral process. The cell bodies are there, so that's the dorsal root ganglion. The central process enters the CNS at a particular spinal cord level based on the dermatome they'll be forming the dorsolateral tract there. Now, this is unique because not terminating there as this one did, but this one is still climbing up again, which means what? As it climbs up again, it will form another tract different from the dorsolateral tract, of course. So it will form another tract. And this one goes up to the middle of Lungat, that's where it terminates. So for this one, you'll talk about the dorsolateral tract, but again, you'll also talk about that other tract and we're going to see which tract is that one, basically, when you look at specific pathways. So the concept here is that the central process may form one tract only, the dorsolateral tract for spinal nerves. It may also form more than one tract. And so we want to know the name of the tracts formed by the first order sensory neuron central processes. Then you tell us the level of termination, like in this case, it's terminating at the level of the medulla. And you give us the, new, the name of the nucleus. So when it follows the specific pathways, we'll give a name to that nucleus as well. But this one is called nucleus gracilis. It's found in the medulla. That is where it will see as the second of the sensory neuron. Good. Now we can talk about the third element, which is the second order sensory neuron. Here, that is the receptor, and this is the first order sensory neuron, which has reached the brainstem or spinal cord. It synapses with the second order sensory neuron. So the second sensory neuron has its cell body within the brainstem or spinal cord. Look at the structure of the second sensory neuron, mostly multipolar neuron. So the point of synapse of the first order sensory neuron is most likely where the cell bodies of the second sensory neurons are also found. The second sensory neuron therefore begin at the site of termination of the first order sensory neuron. And since they are multipolar, their cell bodies, which are sensory nuclei, are located at the point of synapse, which correspond with the termination of the first order sensory neuron. So this nucleus contains the cell bodies of the second order sensory neuron. It's a sensory nucleus. The axonal processes of the second order sensory neuron must do two things they must decassette and then they must climb upwards so that they go to wherever they are going. So usually they'll have to decassette. To decassette is to cross over, which means if they're on the right, they go to the left and if they're on the left, they go to the right. Perhaps we'll give a few exceptions when you follow specific pathways, but that's the general template, the decasset. After the decassation, they climb upwards towards the thalamus, again, with a few exceptions. As they climb upward, they'll be forming a tract as they go up. Now, I'll introduce the term lemniscus here. A lemniscus is a compressed fiber tract traversing the brainstem. The reason is that the brainstem has several things within it. And so when you have white fibers, they may have to be compressed 
or compacted so that they can pass through small regions as possible. So a lemniscus is a compressed fiber tract. And there are four lemniscal systems in the brain. We have what you call medial lemniscus. We have what you call lateral lemniscus. We have what we call spinal lemniscus. And we have trigeminal lemniscus. There are four lemniscal systems in the brainstem. When we discuss specific pathways, we'll state which specific lemniscus is for which sensation. But as a concept, understand that second order sensory neurons, when they traverse the brainstem, they'll form lemniscal systems. The aim of the second order sensory neuron is to terminate in the thalamus, where it will synapse with the third order sensory neuron. Now at the thalamus, they'll be synapsing at a particular thalamic nucleus. So the concept here again is that the thalamus has several nuclei. Several sensations will synapse in this nuclei, in some of the nuclei there. Okay, so that's the general story. So if you are discussing an ascending pathway, what would you want to highlight in your description when you are under this particular third element, what you are calling the second sensory neuron? Tell us the following. One, the site of origin of the second sensory neuron. Where does it start? So remember you are giving a story and you've already told us that the receptor for this sensation is this thing. Then the first order neurons are carried by this nerve. Their cell bodies are found here. The central process enter this level, the spinal cord or brainstem. They form this tract and uh, they synapse at this nucleus. Now you begin second sensory neuron and you tell us now second neurons begin from this nucleus which is found at this level of the CNS. So remember the site of origin of the second order sensory neuron is basically where the first order sensory neuron terminated is the same thing. After that, okay, so maybe just to mention in terms of site of origin, we want to know the CNS level, is it spinal cord, is it brainstem? And if it's brainstem, which part of the brainstem? and the nucleus, basically the name of the nucleus. After you told us the site of origin, we want to know the site and name of the decussation that the second sensory neurons form. That might sound hard, but as a general concept again, the site of decussation is usually the same site as the site of the nucleus because immediately secondary neurons are formed, they decussate. That's a general rule for most ascending pathways. Immediately, the second ascension neuron arises, it crosses over before it can climb up. So the site of decussation is the same as the site of origin, basically. But what's the name of the decussation? The decussations are named. That's a concept you need to know, that the decussations are named. And different decussations have different names. I'll just give you a few from this template. And the few are the ones that are generally the ones you'll have to remember, basically. Once they decussated, they'll have to climb up. So forming tracts, and if it's at the level of the brainstem, also forming lemniscal system. So you'll give us a name of the track they form and the name of the lemniscal system formed. This second sensory neurons travel through the spinal cord if they started from the spinal cord, then through the brainstem as lemniscal systems, 
all the way to the thalamus. And when they go to the thalamus, the synapse in a particular nucleus. So give us the name of the nucleus of the thalamus where the secondary sensory neurons also synapse. Remember the nucleus in the thalamus where the secondary sensory neuron synapse is actually the cell body of the third order sensory neuron. So that's the whole story regarding the second order sensory neuron. The things that need to be highlighted have made mention of them. Maybe let's use some images to illustrate that. Let's look at this one. So here, let's begin it from the first order sensory neuron. The pseudonipolar neuron has come in. This is the peripheral process that the cell body, where the ganglion is located, and that the central process entering first forming the dorsolateral tract of Lissauer there. And in this particular example, the first order neuron terminate in the spinal cord, in particular, the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. That's a nucleus of termination. And so that's where the cell bodies of the second order sensory neurons are found. So now, your discussion points are the beginning, the origin of the second order sensory neuron, in this case, is the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The level is spinal cord. After that, we want to know the site and name of the decassation. So this second sensory neuron decassate, as we can see there. So this decassation has a name. For the spinal cord, most of this will be decassating at the white matter just in front of the gray matter of the central gray matter, the white matter just in front of the central gray matter. Maybe from this image, we are able to pick that. So this white matter just in front of the pericentral gray matter, we call that the anterior white commissure. The anterior white commissure is the name of the decassation for spinal nerves most of them will cross at that point. Okay, as simple as that, the name of the decassation, anterior white commission of the spinal cord, the level is spinal cord. You see, mostly they'll be the same level. It may not be the actual segment because some neurons will not necessarily be cassette horizontally like that. Maybe it is formed here, but we'll make climb some two, three segments above before decassation or as it decassates. But uh, the concept here is that it's still within the spinal cord. Once it has decasseted, it will climb up as a tract. So you give us the name of the tract and if this was brainstem, it will also be forming a lemniscus. You give us the name of the lemniscus. The intention of this second sensory neuron is to reach the thalamus. So we'll be mentioning that shortly. So these ones, you see the second sensory neurons coming in. Sorry, first order neuron come in. The second sensory neuron begin from here. They usually cross over before they climb. So that's what is being appreciated in that particular image of the neurons cross over at the decassation point there. Now let's look at this. So these are still more examples of the same concept. For this one, the first order sensory neuron terminated there. This is similar to what we just described. Second order sensory neuron begin from the dorsal horn and this one decassate 
and then climb up. So we want to know the name of the tract formed. If this one reaches the brainstem, it will form a lemniscal system here. So you want to know the name of the lemniscal system. The aim is for it to terminate in the contralateral thalamus as shown there. We want to know the name of the thalamic nucleus. I'll tell you something about the thalamic nucleus shortly. In this other one, first order sensory neurons entered, formed a tract, then another tract all the way to the brainstem. Second one neurons begins from there. So we want to know the name of the nucleus and the label in this case, the medulla. Then the site of decussation, medulla, and the name of the decussation. So this one, that decussation has a name, we'll talk about it. And then the tract formed, in this case, it will be a lemniscus because we're already in the brainstem. So which lemniscal system is that one? As you can see, that's the medial lemniscal system. Again, it will terminate in the thalamus and we'll be mentioning the thalamic nuclei. I've chosen to show you just a segment of the brainstem and illustrate to you that indeed there are several things which are usually in the brainstem and that is where there's need to form the lemniscal systems. In this particular image, I've chosen to use midbrain as an example. So there are several things within midbrain. And so the ascending tracks will take just a small corner. And so they'll be compressed there. These are the lemniscae. Or that one. Okay. The aim is that the lemniscal systems will eventually terminate within the thalamus. When they terminate within the thalamus, they'll relay in a particular sensory nucleus of the thalamus. As we know, the thalamus has several nuclei because it has several functions. One of the key functions of the thalamus is sensory relay. It's a sensory relay center. So there's some sensory nuclei for sensory relay. And we talk of sensory relay, I'm just referring to it being points of synapse between the second and the third order sensory neurons. In as much as there are several nuclei in the thalamus, the thalamic sensory relay nuclei are not that many. There are only four, and we can even group them into just two. So we have what we call the ventroposterior nucleus of thalamus. It is this one here, ventroposterior nucleus of thalamus. This ventroposterior nucleus of thalamus has two nuclei within it. There is what we call the ventroposterolateral, and there's what we call the ventroposterol medium. So, okay, let me show that again. This is ventroposterolateral, and it is, this is ventroposteromedial. Those are the ventroposterior nuclei of thalamus. And then we have what we ha call the metathalamus. Metathalamus also consists of two nuclei, the medial geniculate body, and the lateral geniculate body. I told you that there are four, but we can even narrow them into two. Let's go with the four. VPL, VPM, MGB, and LGB. Four nuclei for sensory relay. What you're eager to know now is which nucleus is for which sensation. <laughs> 
and it's not as complicated as it may sound. Let me break it down in a simple way. The ventroposterolateral nucleus is the point of synapse of all sensations, and I mean all, that were carried by spinal nerves. All of them. As long as the sensation was conveyed by a spinal nerve, it came from the rest of the body, not head region in that particular sense. There were first order neurons fine, then there are second order neurons fine. There are second order neurons related to those sensations will synapse in the ventroposterolateral nucleus of thalamus, all of them. Now that makes your work really, really easy because when you remove those ones, the others are very few exceptions. So VPL, all sensations, as long as they come from the body region, pain, temperature, touch, pressure, vibration, proprioception, as long as it's from the body region, not the head region, so that it will be carried by a spinal nerve and not a cranial nerve. It will synapse in the VPL. All right, so that is VPL. And maybe in this particular image, this is the anterior thalamus, this is posterior thalamus. So maybe that's left, that's right. So this is the ventroposterolateral nucleus of thalamus. And maybe that's the ventroposteromedial nucleus of thalamus. So ventroposterolateral nucleus of thalamus for synapse of body sensations. Second order and third order synapse there. How about the VPM, ventroposteromedial nucleus of thalamus, this one? The ventroposteromedial nucleus of thalamus is the point of synapse of all sensations that come from the head region except three. And I'm going to give you those three. So the sensations which come from the head region, they're unique because they are carried by cranial nerves. The sensations which are being carried by cranial nerves synapse in the ventroposteromedial nucleus of thalamus, except three. And let me just give you the exception straight away so that you don't mix them. Three exceptions. One is the sensation of smell. Smell sensation does not relay in the thalamus. It is the only, okay, let me put it this way. It does not relay in the thalamus before it reaches the cortex. It is the only sensation that the pathway does not pass through thalamus before reaching the cerebral cortex. So because for smell, the second order neurons don't pass through thalamus before going to the cortex, there'll be no need to synapse. So it doesn't synapse at BPM. The other two exceptions are vision and hearing. And I'm going to tell you where they synapse shortly. Vision and hearing. So apart from smell, vision, and hearing, all the other sensations from the head region, whether it's pain from the head region, or whether it's taste, they'll synapse at ventroposteromedial nucleus of thalamus. Okay, so that is the ventroposterior nucleus. Then we have what we call the metathalamus. Metathalamus is a term used to refer to the geniculate bodies. We have medial geniculate body and you have the lateral geniculate body. The medial geniculate body 
is for auditory relay. So the sensations of hearing, the synapse at that point, medial geniculate body for the pathway of hearing. The impulse that come from the spiral organ of Koti, they relay at that point. Then LGB is for relay of vision. So the impulses that are carried through optic nerve, optic tract will relay there with their third order sensory neurons. Latogenicled body for visual relay, mediogenicled body for auditory relay. So those are the thalamic nuclei generally and understand them from this template there. Right, let's talk about the fourth and the last element of the pathway. And that is the third order sensory neurons. The third order sensory neuron begin from a specific thalamic nucleus, basically where the second order sensory neuron terminated. This third order sensory neuron will be the one arising from there to go to the cerebral cortex. The axons of the third order sensory neuron therefore must pass through some parts of the cerebrum as they go to the cerebral cortex. There are two parts of the cerebrum that they'll have to go through from their nucleus, what we call the internal capsule and what we call the corona radiator as they go to the cerebral cortex. When they reach the cerebral cortex, they terminate in layer four of the cerebral cortex, but specifically on a primary sensory cortex designated for the sensation that we're talking about. For example, if it's pain, they will have to go to the post gyrus. If it is vision, they love to go to the primary visual cortex. But wherever they go, it is layer four of the cerebral cortex, which you call the inner granular layer of the cerebral cortex. All right. So if you are discussing an ascending pathway, and we are at this fourth element, what are some of the things we wanted to highlight? So remember you've talked about how the second neuron has come from its nucleus, decassated, you've given us the name of the decassation and the level. The tract come lemniscus formed by the second sensory neurons and up to where the second neuron terminated in the thalamus on a particular nucleus. So for the third order neuron, we want to know that nucleus remember the same nucleus where the second neuron has terminated. That nucleus, the point of origin of the fibers. Then you want to know the part of the internal capsule where the third order sensory neuron axons will pass. As a general concept, when this nuclei, when these axons arise from their respective thalamic nuclei, they go through the internal capsule. But the internal capsule has several parts. There's the anterior limb, the genu, posterior limb, retrolentiform and sublentiform part. The good news that not all those parts will be having the third order sensory neurons. So which part of the internal capsule convey or carry the third order neurons. For most sensations which relate in the thalamus, that means we are excluding olfaction. For most sensations that relate in the thalamus, 
the third the sensory neurons pass through the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Posterior limb of the internal capsule. That's where most of them pass. But there are two exceptions. The two exceptions are for vision and hearing. The pathway of vision, the third order neurons for vision, pass through the retrolentiform part of the internal capsule. And I'll be showing you an image to that effect. Retrolentiform part of the internal capsule. Then the pathway for hearing pass through the sublentiform part of the internal capsule. So we have sublentiform for hearing, retrolentiform for vision, and the posterior limb of the internal capsule for everything else. As straightforward as that. Now, once they go through the internal capsule, you know, internal capsule is a compact zone because it's a white fiber that is passing between some nuclei. But after that, the fibers are now given the degree of freedom of spanning the cortex. So they go out from the internal capsule to radiate away towards the cortex, which is expansive. As they do that one, they form some axonal radiation. As a general concept, that axonal radiation is known as the corona radiator. Corona radiator. However, there's some that may have specific name. The one for hearing and vision are the ones that I want to give you here, actually. So the one for vision is called optic radiation. But because they come from lateral geniculate body to go to the primary visual cortex, which is the banks of the calcarine sulcus, optic radiation may also be called geniculo calcarine radiation. Genicular calcarine radiation is optic radiation. It's the name of the axonal radiation for the pathway of vision. And then for the pathway of hearing, we have auditory radiation. So remember optic radiation, and auditory radiation. And for the others, just talk about the corona radiator. I'll show you an image for that. Lastly, tell us where the third of the neuron will terminate. Of course, it will terminate the cortex. So there are some three key things we want to know about that point of termination. It will be on a particular lobe. Give us the name of the lobe. Is it parietal lobe, which happened for most sensations, as you already know? Or is it temporal lobe, that will be for hearing? Is it occipital lobe, that will be for vision? Give us the name of the gyrus as well. If it's pain, you will perhaps talk about post-central gyrus. If it's vision, the banks of calcarine sulcus. If it's hearing, the transverse temporal gyri or the transverse gyri of Heschel. Then give us the cortical functional area. What's the name of the cortex where these third order neurons are terminating? So if it's post gyrus, then remember that one is the one we are calling the primary somatosensory cortex, which is area number 312. If it is vision, then you're talking about primary visual cortex, area number 17. If it is hearing, then we call it primary auditory cortex, area number 41 and 42. 
So highlight those three. Well, if and if you don't know the Broadman's number, no big deal, but at least um, these three need to come out. The lobe, the name of the gyrus, and the name of the cortex. That is what you talk about when you discuss the third order sensory neuron. So I'd already told you about the thalamic nuclei. So told you for third order neurons, we want to know the origin of the third order neurons. Are they from VPL, VPM, MGB or LGB? Talk about that. Once they have come out from the nuclei, they'll pass through the internal capsule. This is the internal capsule, the one shaded here. This is the head of caudate nucleus. This is thalamus, and this is a lentiform nucleus, which consists of putamen to the lateral aspect and the globus pallidum on the medial aspect. The whole thing is called lentiform. This internal capsule has five parts but we are able to see four on this view. This is the anterior limb of the internal capsule. This is the genu of the internal capsule. This is the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And perhaps this is the retrolentiform part of the internal capsule. We have an axial section. And so we are not able to see the part of the internal capsule that is below the lentiform which we call the sublentiform part. All in all, the retrolentiform part of the internal capsule is where the fibers for vision will pass for optic radiation. So this is optic radiation, that one. They pass through the retrolentiform part of the internal capsule. The posterior limb of the internal capsule is where most fibers from the thalamus to the cortex will pass as long as they're not for hearing and they're not for vision. So this other image perhaps shows that thing being called the superior thalamic radiation representing the sensory tracts which actually go to the to, from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex. These are the ones which are largely sensory to the cerebral cortex. So they're going to primary sensory cortices. Remember, optic will pass through the retrolentiform part. And uh, for acoustic radiation or auditory radiation will pass through the sublentiform part of the internal capsule from the mediogenic late body. This captures the concept of the corona radiata, the concept of axonal radiation from the internal capsule. When they come from internal capsule, now they have freedom to span through the cortex. And that's why we talk about radiation, as you can see there. Or as you can see here, from the internal capsule, a tiny region, the axons must span through. This is a coronal view, this is an axial view. When they reach the cerebral cortex, they will go to a particular gyrus, but on that gyrus, they'll go to layer four. So remember, this is the cortex, and histologically, that's the cortex. The cortex, uh, neocortex has six layers. The sensory, the third order neurons terminate in this layer, which we call the inner granular layer. So the inner granular layer is the thalamic input center. This image show you the different cortical regions and perhaps what, where we expect whatever to go through. So the postcentral gyrus, that's the primary somatosensory cortex, area number 312 for general sensations. Then we have the primary visual cortex, which is expected to be somewhere there, or if you had a middle aspect, we'll have it better. The banks of calcarine sulcus for vision. So I want you to know, I think I don't have to go through this, 
you wanted to know the lobe, the gyrus, and the name of the cortex. If you know the Bronman's number, fine, you can give us. Great. For primary somatosensory cortex, maybe a smaller detail might help as well, but if you're not so sure, you can just ignore it. Remember the concept of homunculus. So if you are tracing pain from the big toe, we know that it will terminate in the primary somatosensory cortex, yes, but which aspect? Middle aspect. As opposed to if you're tracing pain from the upper limb, we know where it will go. Or pain from the lower chain, lower jaw, we know where it will go. Just the concept of the hormone class, I just want you to have it in mind so that you can even pinpoint which part of the cerebral cortex those third order sensory neurons actually terminate to. Great. So now we've finished the concept of the template. The template I've given you has captured four elements of an ascending pathway that need to come out when you discuss an ascending pathway. We've discussed the sensory receptor, the first order sensory neuron, second order sensory neuron, and third order sensory neuron. And I've told you the things you need to capture. Now I want us to talk about some specific sensory pathways based on some modalities. And in as much as uh, the one, the template I've talked about is not necessarily how the question be put to you. If you are given a question, you most likely be given a question based on specific sensory pathways as opposed to be a template. But over time, I've realized that if I just teach you the specific sensory pathway and you don't know the template, you even become more confused. That's why I took my time for close to one hour or so to just describe for you the basic template of an ascending pathway. So here we'll do it in a rush. So because it's now just a matter of filling in the gaps. If you've understood that template, this is going to be straightforward. But when we ask you questions, this is what we'll ask you. So I just want to integrate the two very well. And then at your own time, you practice, pinpoint any particular region of the body, any particular sensation, and talk about the pathway. Right, so I'll teach you some specific sensory pathways. The following are the sensory pathways that I'll teach you. We have what we call the anterior lateral pathway or other is known as the spinothalamic pathway. We have what we call the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway. We have spinocerebellar pathways. We have trigeminal pathways. And then we have visual pathway, gustatory pathway, auditory pathway, vestibular pathway. This last one we are not going to discuss. They are better discussed when you are looking at the specific spatial sensation. So we discuss the pathway of, speci of spatial sensations when we are discussing the spatial sensory receptors in detail but you still have the template. So here I'll only address the first four. Let's start with what I've called the anterolateral pathway. The anterolateral sensory pathway is the pathway for the following sensations. Pain sensation, temperature sensation, crude touch and pressure from the body region. And because from the body region, these sensations will therefore be relayed by spinal nerves as opposed to cranial nerves. That's what I want to capture there. Once again, remember I've already given you a template, but now I'm giving you specific things which are unique 
to the anterior lateral pathway. When you're discussing anterior lateral pathway, these are the sensations that it will carry. And so if you're discussing temperature from the lower limb, it means we'll discuss the anterior lateral pathway and not any other pathway. If you're discussing pressure from the lower limb or from the buttocks, you'll be describing the anterior lateral pathway, which is also called the spinothalamic pathway, and not any other pathway. Now, the first order neurons for the anterior lateral pathway usually enter and synapse at the dorsal gray horn. So that is the nucleus of termination of the first order sensory neurons. Remember the story is the same from the start. They'll come from a receptor. And so you know if it's pain, which receptors are for pain, if it's temperature, which ones are then, if pressure, which, one, which receptors are those ones. You already know that from, from what I taught you earlier. Now they'll enter, and that will also depend on which nerve, which body region you're talking about. For example, if it's pressure from the gluteal region, then you're talking about the gluteal nerves, for example. If it's pain from the anterior knee, then maybe you're talking about a different nerve could be some branches of femoral nerve, for example. Okay, the dorsal root ganglion is standard. The central process entering is standard. The dorsal lateral tract of Lissau is standard. The spinal segment where these ones enter will depend on the body region, the dermatome. But of point to note is that for anterolateral pathway, the first order neuron synapse in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. After the synapse, the second order neurons begin from there and decassate. So this decassation has not been shown nicely. It should come in front as we agreed through the ventral white commissure. Once they decassate through the ventral white commissure, now you understand that they'll have to occupy this side, the anterolateral aspect of the spinal cord white matter. And that is why we call them the anterolateral pathway. That's why we call it anterolateral pathway. They decassate, the neurons decassate and occupy the anterolateral aspect of the spinal cord white matter and then travel upwards. From the spinal cord to the thalamus. And that is why we call it the spinothalamic pathway. Remember, when neurons are within the brainstem, they'll form a particular lemniscal system. The lemniscal system that uh, the spinothalamic pathway forms. <laughs> is called the spinal lemniscus. I told you that there are four lemniscal systems. Spinal lemniscus is what spinothalamic pathway forms. There are other lemniscal systems, which are not necessarily for the anterolateral pathway. Now, usually when we discuss the anterolateral pathway, most books will tell you that uh, there are two pathways within one the lateral spinothalamic tract and the ventral spinothalamic tract. The lateral spinothalamic tract is for pain and temperature sensation, while the ventral spinothalamic tract is for crude touch and pressure. However, other books also view this just as a continuum rather than separate tracts. So no big deal. I've already told you that at the level of the brainstem, 
the spinothalamic tract forms the spinal lemniscal system. So that is spinothalamic pathway. We can use these images to understand it better. So look at that one. The first one, the neurons have entered from this aspect. Okay, cell body is there. First order neurons enter the dorsolateral tract of Lissauer, terminating the dorsal horn with second order neuron, which decassates through the anterior white commissure, then occupy the anterior lateral aspect of the spinal cord white matter. Climb as spinothalamic tract. When they reach the brainstem, it will form spinal lemniscus, but will still terminate in the thalamus. So which thalamic nucleus will this be? Go back to the template. We will fill the gap. We know this is ventral, posterior, lateral nucleus of thalamus. And uh, which part of the cerebral cortex with the third order neurons synapse? We know this will be post central gyrus, primary somatosensory cortex within the parietal lobe. And of course, the other story is standard from the internal capsule, sorry, from the thalamus, they'll have to go through internal capsule. Now we know it will be posterior limb of the internal capsule and then corona radiata and then postcentral gyrus. Now look at this image here. It will show you how the spinothalamic tract is. So we are using, these ones have been coded a bit. So the ones which are in blue are the ones representing the tracts which go up, the sensory tracts, then the red are descending. So we are focusing on the blue region. So the one written 5A and 5B represent the anterolateral pathway. 5B is the anterior spinothalamic tract, and 5A is the lateral spinothalamic tract. As I mentioned earlier, you can just look at it as a continuum, so you don't have to split them into two, so just call it the spinothalamic tract. But importantly, you can think through how the fibers are organized. If neurons are going to come this way, synapse, then secondary neurons cross like this. It means that the ones that crossed earlier, the ones which entered from the lower parts of the body, will occupy the most lateral zone. And then the ones that enter at upper segments of the cord will be packed like that. And so that's why the cervical region will have, sorry, the cervical region, the fibers from the cervical region will be more medial and the fibers from the sacral region will be more lateral. From the lower part of the body, the fibers will be more lateral and the fibers from the upper part of the body will be more medial. That's how they're organized within the spinothalamic tract. So this still captures the concept of spinothalamic pathway First of the neurons enter synapse in the dorsal gray and then cross over and then climb up to the thalamus. From the thalamus, third of the neurons go to the cortex. I want you to then go back to the template and fill in the particular details concerning the anterior lateral pathway. Because I've just highlighted for you the key concepts to note. So you go back to the template and fill in now. Let's try another pathway. Dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway. The dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway is a pathway for proprioceptive sensations, for exteroceptive, which is uh, touch pressure related, and uh, also for vibratory sensations. 
Now, this one will also be relayed specifically by spinal nerves. Again, we are not talking about cranial nerves here, spinal nerves. The first order neurons for these ones enter. Again, just like the ones for spinothalamic through the dorsal horn, they enter through the dorsolateral tract of Lissau. However, for this column, the first order sensory neurons do not synapse in the spinal cord. If something happened to that, it's just a collateral like that one. And we'll talk about the collateral shortly when you talk about the spinal cerebellar pathways. So the main one enter through the dorsolateral tract, then occupy the medial portion, the dorsal column, sorry. The first order neurons enter through the dorsolateral tract, then occupy the dorsal white matter of the spinal cord. And that is why we call the dorsal column pathway, because they occupy the dorsal white matter of the spinal cord. Remember, those are first order sensory neurons, central processes. So a decussation has not happened yet. In terms of how the fibers are organized, the fibers which come from the lower parts of the body will be more medially placed because as you add fibers, the fibers from upper part of the body will be successfully, successively just shifting the lower fibers medially. For that reason, there are two tracts within the dorsal column. The medial one is called the fasciculus gracilis. That will be carrying sensations from the lower part of the body. And the latter one is called fasciculus cuneatus. It will be carrying sensations from the upper part of the body. So we have fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. The first order neurons, central process of first order neurons, climb all the way as fasciculus gracilis for lower part of the body and fasciculus cuneatus, upper part of the body, all the way to the medulla oblongata. That is where they'll synapse. And where do they synapse? On their respective nucleus. So fasciculus gracilis will synapse in fasciculus in the nucleus gracilis, sorry. And fasciculus cuneatus will synapse in the nucleus cuneatus. Remember, they're in the medulla. After the synapse, the second neurons form their decussation. The name given to the decussation of the dorsal column is this one, which we call the internal aquat fibers. So the internal aquat is the name given to the decussation of the dorsal column. It is present in the medulla. And after that, the second neurons occupy the anterior medial portion of the brainstem in the medulla in particular. And that is why we call it the medial lemniscal system. So medial lemniscus represent second neurons. Dorsal column are central processes of the first order neuron for this pathway. The fibers of medial lemniscus will go all the way to the thalamus. Now we know the nucleus of termination, VPL. We know then that after that, go through internal capsule, posterior horn, and then corona radiator, then post central gyrus in the parietal cortex, in the parietal lobe for this kind of sensation, vibration and proprioception largely. So if you follow that, this image shows you where the dorsal column will occupy. Understand therefore that when fibers enter now from this side, first order neurons will enter the solar tract. They don't synapse, they just enter and occupy this zone. 
So the fibers from the lower part of the body will be shifted medially. And that is where the sacral region is the most medial, followed by lumbar, then thoracic, and then uh, cervical. The difference between fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus is that uh, gracilis will carry information from the lower part of the body and uh, cuneatus upper part of the body. The junction is T6. So cuneatus will have from T6 upwards, gracilis from that downwards. That also captures the concept of dosocolum medial amniscopathy. If first the neurons entered without synapsing, climb all the way to the medulla, form the internal acute decussation, then medial amniscal system to the thalamus, then primary sensory cortex. So again, I'll want you to fill in the specific details for the medial lemniscal dorsal column pathway or the other way around, dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway. So you fill in the name of the receptors. And if you've been given a particular region, then you talk about that particular region as well in terms of narrowing down to the dermatom concept, the name of the peripheral nerve, and things like that from the template. So you have to go back to the template again and fill in the concept of the whole pathway of dorsal column medial amniscal pathway. That's why I took time to go through the template. So have understanding that medial amniscal pathway is very different from the spinothalamic pathway. The images there show you the difference. So we can use this one. So this one is spinothalamic pathway, fibers enter, synapse in dorsal horn, second one neurons cross over, climb in the anterolateral aspect of the spinal cord as spinothalamic or at this point, spinal lemniscus to the thalamus. Compare that with this one. In the dorsal column pathway, the first one the neurons enter without synapsing, climb in the dorsal white matter of the spinal cord as either fasciculus gracilis or cuneatus. Synapse in their respective nucleus from the internal acute decussation and then medial amniscal system to the thalamus. So this will be medial amniscal system. This is spinal amniscal system. The sensations here are different from the sensations here. These images show you where the dorsal column is found, or that one, and also where the spinothalamic path is found. I told you that spinothalamic, we don't have to split it into anterior and lateral because it's a large continuum generally. But uh, yes, the lateral one will be having more of temperature and pain, and the anterior will be more of touch and pressure. And in terms of how the fibers are organized, the ones from the lower parts for spinothalamic will be more peripheral. And the ones from the upper parts will be more central. If you understand how the decussation occurred and how the fibers are packed. That's different from dorsal column. The fibers from the lower part of the body will be more medial. And the ones from the upper part of the body will be more lateral, dividing into fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus. The other pathway to talk about are the spinal cerebellar pathways. These are unique pathways because they are now not going to the cerebral cortex. So they don't follow the, 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 the three model of afferent system, first order, second order, third order neuron, no. They don't have those three models. Let's discuss them. So there are two principal spinocerebellar tracts. We have what you call the dorsal spinocerebellar tract and the ventral spinocerebellar tract. 
they occupy this zone of the spinal cord. The peripheral aspect of the lateral white column, that region there. And so these are the spinocerebellar tracts, dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tract. What information do they carry? They carry proprioceptive and cutaneous information to the cerebellum for coordination of movement. So these ones coordinate movement, but the information goes to the cerebellum, which means what? That the information here is subconscious. And so it's different from the dorsal column, medial and muscle pathway, which will still carry proprioception, but conscious, the one that reached the cerebral cortex. That one is conscious proprioception. The spinocerebellar pathways carry unconscious proprioception, but it's helpful in the coordination of movement subconsciously. So in particular, what is, how is the dorsal spinocerebellar tract organized? The dorsal spinocerebellar tract contain second order neurons that originate from the ipsilateral clax column. The, ipsil the clax column usually is a nucleus in that segment, T1 up to L2, that is where we have the clax column. And this nucleus receive collaterals from the dorsal column. If you remember, I showed you the first order neurons from the forming the dorsal column, there were some collaterals. So the collaterals from the dorsal column pathway, which means that they are coming from similar sensory receptors for proprioception. Those collaterals synapse between segment T1 up to L2 in a nucleus called the thoracic nucleus of Clark. It is ipsilateral. Let's see it here. <clears throat> so these neurons have entered, faster than neurons, that the central process that is designated from the dorsal column, medial lemniscal pathway. But these are collateral from the faster than neuron to the spinal cord gray matter. The nucleus of termination of this collateral is what we are calling the clax nucleus. So as we can see, it is ipsilateral, which means same side, it has not decussated. And so the second order neurons that form the dorsal spinocerebellar tract come from there. So when they come from there, this is how they'll go. Now look at this one, the, is that purple? The neuron come in as faster than neuron. And then let's consider that to be a collateral which terminated this clax nucleus. And then the second neuron just climb on the same side as the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. This applies for segment T1 up to L2 of the spinal cord. The fibers will climb all the way to the cerebellum and they'll enter the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. These fibers terminate ipsilaterally. There is no decussation. In particular, they decussate, sorry, in particular, they synapse, they don't decussate, they synapse within the vermis of the cerebellum. So remember the discussion we had about cerebellum is that there's a lobe of the cerebellum, cerebellar vermis, which is called spinocerebellum because it receives information from the spinal cord. 
right, that is the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. How about the ventral spinal cerebellar tract? So the concept of what they are standard anyway, but unique for the ventral spinal cerebellar tract is that the ventral spinal cerebellar tract, which is now this one, contain axons of secondary neurons that have decasseted. So these ones are not ipsilateral, they have decasseted. They originate from contralateral lamina five to lamina seven of the spinal cord gray matter. And in which particular region of the cord? The lumbosacral cord. So the lumbar and sacral cord, which means information largely from the lower limb, is carried by the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. I hope you know this Rex laminae. You know lamina one is there all the way to six, so lamina five will be somewhere there. And lamina seven is somewhere here, corresponding with the root of the lateral cone we are present. Now let's look at this image so that we follow the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. Now we'll follow the green neuron, the green pathway. First order neurons come in. There'll also be collaterals that were designated from the dorsal column. In this case, those collateral synapse in lamina five to lamina seven of the spinal cord gray matter. And so the second neurons begin from there. But in this case, the second neurons decassate through the anterior white commissure and occupy the anterior lateral aspect as well, the periphery of the spinal cord lateral white column. And so they'll climb as the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. And that's why we are saying that the ventral spinal cerebellar tract is a decassated tract. It will climb all the way, pass through the medal of Longata, pass through pons, up to the level of midbrain. And at the level of midbrain, it will enter now the cerebellum through the superior cerebellar pedanco. Once it has entered the cerebellum, the neurons decassate again and synapse within the cerebellar vermis. So double decassation for, the, for that particular pathway, which means that information from the left still goes to the left and information from the right still goes to the right, double decassation. That is spinal cerebellar tract. So remember whether ventral or dorsal, they carry unconscious proprioceptive information, which is important for coordination of movement. Let's talk about the trigeminal tri pathway as the last one. The trigeminal pathways are pathways for general sensations from the head region. So think about the face, facial structures like the eye, the tongue, the nose. And when I say tongue, don't think of taste here. We're talking about general sensation. Even when we talk about the eye, don't think about vision. Think about pain, touch from the cornea, for example. Those are general sensations. In the tongue, pain, temperature, sensation from the tongue, those are general sensations. Even the nose. But also from the anterior scalp, as well as the meninges. So the sensations which go via the trigeminal pathway. The peripheral processes are within the three divisions of the trigeminal nerve. Remember, trigeminal nerve has three divisions. V1 is ophthalmic division, V2 is maxillary division, and V3 is mandibular division. The peripheral processes are within 
those three divisions, any of those three divisions of the terminal nerve. The cell body is located within the trigeminal ganglion, which is within the middle cranial fossa. The central process enter as trigeminal nerve. Usually trigeminal nerve enters and attaches at the level of the pons. So this is basically at the level of pons where the trigeminal nerve is attached. And then from there, it will depend on the sensation being carried. The fibers which are carrying touch sensation terminate directly in a nucleus within pons. We call it the chief or the principal sensory nucleus of trigeminal. So those ones are fibers carrying touch sensation. They synapse in the chief nucleus of trigeminal or what's called the principal nucleus of trigeminal, the chief sensory nucleus of trigeminal. However, the fibers that convey pain and temperature sensation behave differently. Once they enter the pons, those fibers, the central process of the first order neurons descend downwards towards the spinal cord and medalloblongata, or let me say towards medalloblongata and spinal cord. So as they descend that way, it means they'll form a tract. That tract is called the spinal tract of trigeminal. They form a tract, then eventually they synapse within a nucleus. That nucleus is within the medulla oblongata and upper part of the spinal cord. We call that nucleus the spinal nucleus of trigeminal. This spinal nucleus of trigeminal is actually continuous with the dorsal gray horn of the spinal cord. So that is the termination of the second, of the first order neurons, central process of the first order neurons. The proprioceptive and the ones that carry vibration are very unique. The fibers that carry vibration and proprioception do not have their cell bodies within the trigeminal ganglion. Instead, they have their cell bodies within a nucleus within the midbrain, which we call the mesencephalic nucleus of trigeminal. So they're the only first order sensory neurons that have their cell bodies within the central nervous system, mesencephalic nucleus of trigeminal. Those ones carry vibration and proprioception. Anyway, so they'll also synapse there as well, where the cell bodies are, the unipolar neurons, basically. Now I want you to understand that the trigeminal sensory nucleus is a very big nucleus, extending the whole of the brainstem with the three parts. The mesencephalic part, is the one responsible for vibration and proprioception it's located within midbrain. The principal part or the chief part is located within pons. It's responsible for touch sensation. The spinal part is located within the medalloblongata and upper spinal cord. It's responsible for pain and temperature sensation, but it's the whole sensory nucleus of trigeminal with three parts. Once the first order neurons have terminated in the sensory nuclei, we will therefore have second order sensory neurons. The second order sensory neurons decassate in their respective levels. So there are those that decassate at the level of the 
midbrain for vibration and proprioception, pons for touch, and pain and temperature for medulla, okay? At the medulla for pain and temperature. Once they decasset, they climb upwards, forming a tract that we'll now call the trigeminal lemniscus. Remember, this is sensation from the head region, so it will synapse in the ventral, posterior, medial nucleus of thalamus, VPL, sorry, VPM, ventral posterior medial nucleus of thalamus, because this one is from the head region. From there, the story is the same, but if you remember the concept of the homunculus, we won't expect the third order neurons to terminate on this medial aspect now. We'll expect them to go to the region responsible for head in particular. All right, so that is the trigeminal pathway. We've discussed four key specific sensory pathways, the anterolateral, also called spinothalamic pathway, dorsocolum, medial lemniscal pathway, spinocerebellar pathways, and the trigeminal pathway. And so that summarizes the story of the ascending tracks that I wanted to discuss with you, really. But for you to make sense out of this story, remember the template that we talked about, that is the meat of the matter. And then for each specific pathway, you fill in the gaps. And to help you do that, I have some questions projected for you. Just try at your own time, try to trace pain pathway from the palmar aspect of the right middle finger to the cerebral cortex. So give us the name of the receptor, the name of the primary sensory neuron, location of the cell body, the tract formed by the central process. At what point does it enter the spinal cord? You know, that story that you talked about in the template. And which pathway would that be? Then try this one. The path of vibration from the left big toe to the cerebral cortex. So you realize that that will have to be a particular pathway and not another because it's going to the cerebral cortex. And uh, you have to think about again, so which, which pathway specifically will it be? How about from the tongue? You no know, tongue can have taste, but can also have heat or other general sensation. So trace the path of taste up to the cerebral cortex, and then trace the path of heat up to the cerebral cortex. But remember, from the tip of the tongue. So those are two questions in one, and you're doing them separately. And lastly, remember this is unconscious. So if it is unconscious proprioception, where will it go? Think about it and describe that pathway. Right? Thank you very much. As you do this, um, it will help you to integrate the concept of the specific ascending pathways. A common thing we'll ask you, or we do ask, or your teachers will ask you is, so which tract is this on the spinal cord? So again, familiarize with the tract of the spinal cord, which tract is which one, just try to be naming them. And perhaps that will help you to capture that story very well. So I'll stop there. I know I've taken a lot of your time, but ascending tax is indeed a really bulky thing. That is why we couldn't discuss this lecture under spinal cord anatomy in general, but uh, we had a specific time. And imagine we are not yet done with tractology. That was just ascending pathway. We will have another session where we'll be discussing the descending pathways, the motor pathways. Also a bit extensive, but not as extensive as the ascending pathways. Thank you very much. We'll stop there for now.